and we're going to start our, I think this is the 21st presentation. And this one is going to be on one of my favorite cities of all, Gubbio, and a favorite I'm sure of many of you who've been there. So let us start with discovering Gubbio, Italy's city of madmen. And we're certainly going to find out why they're called i matti dell'Italia, those Eugubini, the inhabitants of Gubbio. Gubbio is medieval, exclusively medieval, completely medieval. Very little has ever been added. Very little has ever been taken away. It was built at a time of great prosperity. It flowers in the 14th century when the population of Gubbio was about 50,000. It's now about 31,000, I think just over 30,000. It's a town of wealth, of houses, solid and magnificent, magnificently huge houses. It is a town with a medieval flavor as mentioned. You can see that in the first photo, the wonderful Palazzo dei Consoli. And that is also figured in the very last photo and it's backing the Roman theater. We're going to talk about an astounding young artist of Gubbio because I always like you to meet the people on my tours. Those of you who've been with me to Gubbio have personally seen the wonderful work of Sabrina. We're going to learn about the ancient culture. There's some Etruscan writing up there, which is going to connect us with ancient Gubbio, which was actually never Etruscan, and you'll learn why later they were using the Etruscan alphabet. So let us go now to the marvelous Umbrian city of Gubbio. It is backed by five mountains, five hills. Those form actually their image, the flag of the city of Gubbio. You can see this beautiful medieval hill town just behind the Roman theater. The Roman theater was built in the first century BC. Rome had declared uh, Iguvium, as it was called, a municipality or municipio. It was a prosperous time also during the Roman period. That is uh, um, a theater built of local limestone. It could hold 6,000 people for theatrical presentations. And do you know that every summer in the month of August, there are theatrical presentations in the Roman theater of Gubbio. After we visit the Roman theater, which we're doing now, we're going to visit something related to modern history. Eventually we're going to get up here to city hall and city hall is basically the start of the mad race up the mountain in the late afternoon to this Basilica of Santo Baldo that we will be talking about. So right now we're going to leave the Roman theater our car is parked not far away in the parking lot. We can walk to our next point of interest, which is the Mausoleo dei Quaranta Martiri, the Mausoleum of the 40 Martyrs, built in 1949 of local limestone. And it is related to a very sad episode in the history of Gubbio. June 22nd, 1940, uh, no, excuse me, June 22nd, 1944, um, two uh, persons came down, it was just a couple days before, two persons had come down from the mountain and wounded German officers. Actually, that was on June 20th, the wounding of the German officers. There was a roundabout, a roundup, and they rounded up about over 150 citizens. Um, they were questioned, some were kept, some were released. The questioning went on for a couple days. The Bishop of Gubbio, understanding the trials and tribulations of German retaliation, went to the German commandant. He asked for um, pity for release of those who had been rounded up. Some were elderly women, there were children and all sorts. And the German commandant promised leniency, but the roundup continued the next day. And it continued the questioning through the night of June 21st. And then some were released, 62 of them were left. Of the 62, 22 were taken out to the countryside, not far from the elementary school of Gubbio where they'd been kept. And they were put against this wall and shot. 22 were the ones who actually dug the ditch 
40 were put against the wall and shot. They were bound hands and feet, and there were 38 men and two women. Their bodies were thrown into ditches. Now where the ditches are, there are beautiful red and white flowers with the green border for the colors of Italy, of course, red and white begonias. Near the mausoleum of the 40 martyrs, there's a very beautiful statue, which I'll talk about in a moment. Surrounding the mausoleum of the 40 martyrs are 40 cypress trees, one for each of the 40 martyrs. It is a tragedy of Gubbio. It's still discussed in Gubbio. And why is it especially a very uh, painful tragedy for the people? Perugia had been liberated by the Allies on June 20th, 1944, which was the same day that two partisans, perhaps, or members of the GAP, a, a political group wishing a liberation, of course, from the Germans, shot these two German officers. They were having a coffee in a little cafe of Gubbio. I know which one. One was a medical doctor. He was killed. Another was a lieutenant assisting him. The doctor had been a lieutenant as well, and he was severely wounded. So liberation of Gubbio was imminent when the shooting of the German officers took place. Assisi had already been liberated. And you'll know that if you were able to join in on my talk on the Jewish refugees hidden in Assisi, our liberation was June 17th. Again, Perugia's was June 20th. The shooting of the German officers was June 20th. And the execution of the 40 martyrs was June 22nd, 1944 always remembered in Gubbio. Now let us go in for a second into the mausoleum of the 40 martyrs. You can see it's built like a beautiful, simple Gothic church. These here on the left and the right are the tombs. This person is probably visiting a relative who could be buried in one of these tombs. Um, I remember one time sitting right near the tomb of Be the Bedinis. This is a father and a son who were buried here. And there was a woman sitting here. We started to talk. Uh, this was actually her brother. And she told me the tragic story of how they were taken and questioned and so forth. Now, outside, as I mentioned, there is a lovely sculpture. This is by Vittorio Tomarelli. And the sculpture represents one of the um, executed martyrs, as they're called. And you can see the body. It's partially male and partially female, if you will, if you wish, in its um, um, depiction, because some of the martyrs were male, but two were also female. Uh, every year on April 25th, which is the Festa della Liberazione, celebrating the liberation of Milan from the Germans in 1944, a laurel is carried to the tomb and it will hang above the altar. And there it is right here, the laurel wreath of glory, a tribute to those who died for their country. And this procession takes place in the lower part of Gubbio, right near the Loggia dei Tiratori. And this piazza in front of the Loggia dei Tiratori is actually named after the martyrs. It's called the Piazza of the Forty Martyrs. It was once in the Middle Ages, the Pla Platea Mercatalis, the market square of ancient Gubbio. Tirari means to pull in Italian. And the Loggia dei Tiratori was built in the 17th century. And it was built particularly for the, by the Wool Makers Guild of Gubbio. This was a place where the wool, after it was carded, after it was woven on a loom, could be dyed, then pulled, stretched out, and hung out to dry here at the, lo on the, at the Loggia dei Tiratori, the Loggia of the Pullers. That is, the pullers are the stretchers out of the wool. So we're going up a side street behind the Loggia dei Tiratori to the Palazzo dei Consoli because on April 25th, magnificent festival takes place celebrating the liberation of Italy, April 25th. And this is that of the Sbandieratori or the banner wavers. Those of you who've attended medieval or Renaissance celebrations anywhere in Italy have probably seen performances 
by this bandiera tori, the banner wavers. Great passion, great agility. It's an acrobatic ballet, as if you will, as they fling the flags to the sky. Look at the flags of this bandiera tori of Gubbio. You see the lettering on them? The lettering is in the Etruscan alphabet because the ancient language, pre-Roman uh, language of Gubbio, which was then Ecuvio, uh, was um, Umbro. And the Umbro, when they transcribed anything, used Etruscan letters to transcribe. So these are the Etruscan letters on the flags of these bandiera tori of Gubbio. And here they're doing a wonderful display of um, switching around the flags before throwing them up. This is one of the wonderful moments of the banner wavers is when one will leap over with sweeping that flag under his legs, leap over those of his um, companions who've already performed. One time in a season, I remember the leap was over 10 of them, I think, laying down. I'm sure here in Gubbio they can do the same thing because they have quite a team of bandiera tori. You can see the word there. Bandiera means flags. Bandiera tori is literally the deflaggers, if you will. They're working with flags. You know, the tradition is medieval. It's, it's, it's ancient to the culture of Italy because when there were the city-state wars, the most important person really in the group, besides the soldiers, actually more important than the regular soldiers, he was as important as the lead soldier, was the gonfaloniere, the one who carried the city banner. And in a battle, in the melee, a melee of violence or whatever, when a group was surrounded by the enemies, the objective always of the gonfaloniere was to run with that flag, and if he were captured, fling the flag out of the group, over the heads of the enemy, hoping that one of his co-citizens would grab it and run, thus inspiring the desire to continue to save the city. So very, very attached to the ancient traditions of the country is this display of Zbandiera Tori. They all have particular names, all the motions, all the types of fling, they all know them, they all learn them. There are young children's groups in every town as well. When they're performing and before they perform, the great bell will certainly be ringing up here in the Palazzo dei Consoli, magnificent 14th century uh, building, um, the city hall of ancient Gubbio, of medieval Gubbio, and that bell is rung about 61 times a year. That doesn't mean on 60 days. It's probably rung, because it's manually rung by the bell ringers, um, probably rung maybe uh, just over 20 days, because on some days, it will ring three times. A day that it certainly rings is April 25th, the liberation, but also June 22nd, the day commemorating the 40 martyrs. And there are the Campanari of Gubbio, the team of the 12 bell ringers of Gubbio, near their bells. The bells for the Eugubini are called La Voce di Gubbio, the voice of Gubbio. And you know, there's an expression in the Italian language, which you may know, campanilismo, campanile is bell tower. The loyalty to your bell tower the loyalty in Italy is to one's town, one's village, rather than uh, national unity, which is quite absent in Italy. After all, this is a young country. It was unified in 1861. And this is not a country of nationalism. Italy has been a nation since 1946, with when a referendum, they voted for a democratic republic rather than restoration of the monarchy. So there's a strong sense of campanilismo, the loyalty to your bell tower and the sound of your bell. As Pierluigi Menichetti, Gubbio historian, wrote, the voice of this giant bell is for non-Eugubians, harmonious, beautiful, limpid, interesting. But for the people of Gubbio, it is much more. It is the voice of their native land. It stirs the heart. 
excites emotion and makes eyes glisten. The city of Gubbio underscored the importance in a recent note. It's on the website of the city of Gubbio, but it's in Italian. This is the translation. It is something inextricably tied to this city, giving voice to the life and thoughts of each of us. Sometimes one might entrust to that campanone, the great bell, a dream or a secret desire. Young Katia Mariani, who uh, works for the Civic Palace of Gubbio in the museum, has been a delightful help on preparing this talk. We just talked today. Thank you, Katia. And she's told me some wonderful stories of Gubbio life. She told me that in Gubbio, if a woman is pregnant, if she can, she will go up the stairs to that bell tower if accompanied by a campanaro to touch the bell, thus assuring a good pregnancy, a safe birth. So this bell uh, indicating the voice of Gubbio for the people and representative of their great passion. Now let's hear those bells. And there'll be five bell ringers up in the belfry at any time, not all 12. They work in teams of five in a very well coordinated ritual. Here they are going up the stairs. video, let alone hear that bell in Gubbio. Um, a young girl from Gubbio, her name is, um, let's see, I can't remember what her name is. I should remember, but I don't. Uh, she wrote a note recently on the website of the bell ringers to her uncle. And she said, thank you, Campanari, for each time I hear the voice of our Campanoni, the great bell, the emotion is overwhelming. Thank you, Uncle Enzo, great bell ringer, great Campanaro. And a day of great celebration for the bell ringers is always on October 30th. This is the birthday of the great bell for the largest of the bells, there are three of them, was fused in L'Aquila on October 30th. And they had a great celebration uh, in 2019 for the 250th birthday of the Campanone and the medieval banner wavers of Gubbio performed and they climbed up into the bell tower with the the Campanari. So here you have Sbandieratori di Gubbio with the Campanari di Gubbio. And while they were up there, they held their banners out over the city from the uh, battlements here, the crenellation of the Palazzo dei Consoli. So the bell ringers of Gubbio, Campanari Gubbio IT. That's an interesting website to check out, as is We Are Gubbio with some extraordinary photos. Now, those bells are certainly rung for all the festivities related to the patron saint of Gubbio, Saint Ubaldo, Bishop of Gubbio, who died in 1160, was either born in 1084 or 1085, we're not sure when, and he is one of two patron saints of Gubbio. The other is actually John the Baptist. His body is in the Basilica of Sant'Ubaldo, which is right near the top of Mount Ingino. And there's two ways to go up to the Basilica. You walking up through the dirt roads and so forth, which are gonna be run later by those carrying the candlesticks up the chatty, which we'll see. 
or you can take the funivia di cole e letto, as it's called, the funicular of cole e letto, the chosen hill, for Dante called it the chosen hill, in the 11th canto of the Paradiso of the Divine Comedy, he wrote, Acqua che discende del cole e letto del beato baldo the water which flows down from the chosen hill of blessed Ubaldo. And the ride up is about six minutes. You can go up on it and down on it with Gubbio at your feet. It's absolutely a beautiful ride. And the Funivia or the road, if you're walking it, both take you up to the Basilica of Sant'Ubaldo. The structure you're seeing is an early 16th century structure. There was probably a church up there in the Middle Ages. And after Ubaldo had died, and he died, as mentioned, um, in the 11th century, and there again, excuse me, the 12th century, in 1160, right, his death. And soon after his death, the Bishop of Gubu at the time uh, wanted to know in a dream where he should be buried and apparently had a prophetic dream. And he was told, put the coffin with the saint, he wasn't a saint then yet, with the Bishop Ubaldo in it on a cart driven by playful wild horses, young colts. And where they ever they run, wherever they stop, that is where he should be buried. And they stopped near an area where there was a little medieval church, one to San Gervasio, and that will then be the burial site. Later, this church is restored, the small church is restored and amplified. And it's amplified extensively in the 16th century, also thanks to the affection for Gubbio of Elisabetta Gonzaga who was married to Guidobaldo da Montefeltro. Guidobaldo da Montefeltro was son, uh, son of the Duke of Urbino, Frederick II. And this portrait of Guidobaldo was painted by Raphael in the early 16th century. Raphael also painted this portrait of Elisabetta Gonzaga. These portraits are both in the Uffizi Museum. Guidobaldo of Montefeltro was named Guidobaldo because his father, Frederick II, loved Gubbio, was very devoted to Saint Ubaldo and gave him the name Guido. Ubaldo, if you will. So Guido Baldo. And Elisabetta Gonzaga and also Eleonora Gonzaga were great donors along with Julius II for amplification and restoration of the Basilica of Sant'Ubaldo. The Basilica of Sant'Ubaldo in the 16th century, when they financed a lot of work and amplification on it, grew to three naves, but it was amplified to five naves in the early 20th century. Over the altar in a glass urn is the incorrupt body of Bishop Ubaldo. Behind him are stained glass windows, which are contemporary, and there are stained glass windows in the side chapels. The stained glass windows depict episodes from the life of Bishop Ubaldo and a very important moment in his life, important for the Eogubini, was when the bishop, you can see him on the left, meets Frederick Barbarossa, bearded on the right, outside the city of Gubbio and pleads with the emperor to allow the Eugubini to live in peace. And it said because of this meeting of Ubaldo with Frederick Barbarossa, imperial troops never ventured into the city of Gubbio. <clears throat> Besides Ubaldo's body, the main treasures at the Basilica of Sant'Ubaldo are the three ceri. Cero means candle. Cero means wax. And the three ceri, which we'll be talking about more uh, as we go along in this lecture, the three ceri are carried up to this basilica May 15th in a mad race. 
uh, they weigh about 300 kilos, multiply that by 2.2 pounds. They're over 700 pounds. They're carried on the backs of teams of 20 men up the dirt road to the Basilica in a mad race that takes them only eight minutes. If you ever see it, you'll know why the Ogubini are called i Matti dell'Italia or the Mad Men of Italy. But I'll tell you, I won't be anywhere in the world but in Gubbio on May 15th, the year I passed my guide exams in 1997. Somebody booked a tour with me for May 15th. And I said, well, yes, I was writing letters, I think then. I don't think there was, I don't think I had a computer even. And I asked them which city they wanted to tour, and they said Assisi. And I said, oh, I'll book you another guide. <laughs> and another guide took them around to Sisi, but I was in Gubbio, of course, for the Corsa dei Ceri. And when I go up to the Basilica of Sant'Ubaldo, I can't leave without touching the Cero. No Eogubino would leave that Basilica without touching every single one of the Ceri. And of course, I especially have to touch the Cero of San Giorgio. And behind me, is the flag of San Giorgio, which I wear on a blue jacket on May 15th because the color of San Giorgio is blue. And my dear papa, my dad's name was George. You see, you become a passion of a chero, even in Gubbio, not for a particular district of the town in which you live, but it's an emotional attachment. Uh, a dear artist friend, Sabrina, is a San Giorgiato like me. She's very a passion of Ubaldo, as is everyone in Gubbio. And please understand this. That is a race only in the sense of speed. It's not a race in the sense of who gets there first. The order is always the same. The Cero of Ubaldo, the Cero of Giorgio, royal blue, the Cero of Sant Anthony, they're all wearing black. No one is trying to pass another because arriving at his basilica must be Ubaldo. Whether you're a Giorgiaro, un Ubaldaro, or an Antoniaro, in Gubbio, you are a passion of the patron saint Ubaldo, as is Sabrina, who's not even from Gubbio. She's an artist who's worked in Gubbio about 29 years. She's a painter. Um, she does exquisite paintings as well as stupendi stupendous Maiolica creations. Let us remember that Maiolica is twice fired pottery. So in this panel of St. Ubaldo, she has, um, the panel was is terracotta. It's been dipped in a glaze, it's dry. She's painted Ubaldo and it will be fired. After it's fired, this is another image of Ubaldo. What comes out looks like this. Maiolica double fired pottery. And here is some of the extraordinary work of Sabrina. The ceramics of Gubbio is completely different in design, in colors, in the type of glaze used from that of Deruda. For those of you familiar with the different types of Maiolica of Umbria, we've also talked about and you've seen some of the designs of the Maiolica of Orvieto in my talk on Orvieto, completely different designs than that of Gubbio. In this, um, on this beautiful large vase, she's depicted Palazzo Consoli, the city hall of Gubbio. Uh, she is very talented also in producing Bucaro work, Sabrina. And Bucaro is a black pottery. The Etruscans did marvelous Bucaro. What she's doing is throw, the pot is thrown by her husband, Raimondo. Uh, Raimondo is from a family of Gubbio of ceramicists, father and grandfather, so it's a family tradition. Raimondo and companions throw all the pots. She works the designs on them. She's incising a design here. It will be filled with liquid gold and platinum, then fired at 1,000 degrees centigrade, and what comes out of the kiln is a beautiful object like this. And there's Sabrina. This is again Maiolica, not Bucaro. She's done the first, she's done the painting on the first firing. It'll be fired again. San uh, Francesco of Assisi and the Wolf. 
the wolf of Gubbio are frequent motifs on the Maiolica, not just of Sabrina, but many a potter in Gubbio. This is a plate she did of St. Francis uh, gently patting the head of the wolf. And the story of the wolf of Gubbio is transmitted actually in the um, Fioretti or the little flowers of St. Francis, the legends related to Francis of Assisi, the little flowers were written in the 14th century. And when the wolf of Gubbio is mentioned, the story is told and it is told like this. I'm gonna paraphrase this, but then I'm gonna read you a direct quote from the Fioretti, that the wolf was harassing Gubbio, eating the sheep. And let us remember that Gubbio was always noted for its wool, so that was something devastating for them also economically. But the wolf then attacked the people as well. And it, the situation was extremely um, terrifying for the people. At the time, there was a Franciscan community in Gubbio. Francis's followers, some of them were settling in Gubbio as early as about 1214. And Francis went in Gubbio, uh, went to the wolf, patted him, raised his finger to him and said, Brother Wolf, why are you doing this? Why are you harassing the citizens of Gubbio? Do them no harm and they will feed you. And he asked the citizens of Gubbio to feed Brother Wolf, assuring him thenceforth and for, from then on his gentility. And it said the wolf listened to Francis and then lifted his paw and put it in the outstretched hand of Francis. From the Fioretti, uh, this recounts the end of the life of the wolf. The wolf lived two years in Gubbio. He went familiarly from door to door without hurting anyone. And all the people received him courteously, feeding him with great pleasure. At last, after two years, he died of old age. And the people of Gubbio mourned his loss greatly. For when they saw him going about so gently amongst them all, he reminded them of the virtue and sanctity of St. Francis. So Francis is strongly linked to Gubbio, and not just for the wolf. One of the first churches dedicated to St. Francis was built in Gubbio. Francis's first, uh, how can we say, strong association with Gubbio came after the battle with um, Perugia at Colestrada in 1202. And Francis, with many young Assisani, was taken prisoner. He found himself in a dungeon with a young boy from Gubbio, Giacomello Spadalonga, who will become his friend. And Francis decides to go to Gubbio to seek out Giacomello Spadalonga after his break with his own family in Assisi. And those of you who've heard my other talks on Assisi will certainly recognize this fresco in the Basilica of St. Francis, late 13th century, attributed to the school of Giotto, let us say. Another long story is that one. And Francis has stripped himself naked before Bishop Guido of Assisi, thrown his clothes back at his father, saying, Pietro of Bernardone, you are no longer my father. Henceforth, let me say, only our father who art in heaven. And you can see him looking at the hand of God. So this is the break with his family. He's renounced his earthly patrimony. He's decided after the war with Perugia that he will dedicate his life uh, to poverty. And he sets off to Gubbio. The walk to Gubbio takes him a couple days. There are joyous moments and difficult moments. He arrives in Gubbio. He's at the home of Giacomello Spadalunga. The Spadalungas take him in. and. The father of Giacomello, Bernardo, gives him his first cloak, if you will. And Francis asks, it's a tunic, really. He asks for a tunic of undyed wool. And this will eventually become the habits of the little brothers, the Frati Minori. And I think most of you know that the symbol of the Franciscans is OFM, Order of Friars Minor. And... Uh, the father of um, Giacomello Spadalonga was a merchant, as was 
the father of Francis of Assisi, Pietro Bernardoni, and lived in comfort and wealth. And in 1214, Spadalonga donated to the Franciscans a house and a warehouse where the first community in Gubbio could gather. And he also uh, wanted, after his death and so forth, some of the property of the Spadalongas was given to the Franciscans for the building of a church. And the, the case of San Francisco was started in 1256, just 30 years after the death of Francis of Assisi in 1226. Uh, authorized by Pope Alexander IV, who authorized this construction of a church on the Spadalonga property. Work went on rapidly, for devotion to Francis was intense in Gubbio, as you can imagine. The first Franciscan Pope, Nicholas IV, was eager to see this church dedicated to the founder of his order completed. And he promulgated indulgences to any of those contributing on the work of the church. And it was finished, therefore, very rapidly. At one time, it was probably all adorned with lovely frescoes. Most are lost to us now, with the exception of the lovely frescoes by Ottaviano Nelli, who's a Gubbio painter. And he frescoed in the 15th century, 14 episodes uh, of the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The church was restored over the centuries significantly, and there was a radical transformation of the church in the 18th century. Um, what's interesting, if you're in the church, is to see the sacristy on the right-hand side, and the sacristy is the place which is said to have been the place where the Spadalongas lived and gave the first tunic to Francis. There's a cloister attached to the church and outside of the cloister, a contemporary statue by Roberto Bellucci of Francis and the Wolf of Gubbio. That is not the only Franciscan church in Gubbio. The other small church, not far from Palazzo dei Consoli, as you can see, is called San Francesco della Pace, Francis of Peace. And this church is very strongly related to the um, episode of Francis and the Wolf, for there's an inscription over the door saying that it's dedicated to God and to Francis, lover of peace. And inside the church, let's see, we're going inside the church now, where you see the first ring on the right, this is a little altar. It was brought here in 1564, I think, mid 16th century from another small church. It is said to be the altar table on which Francis gave thanks after having created peace with a wolf. On the left side of the little chapel are the three beloved statues. Let me just show you, they're here in this niche and I didn't wanna to move too quickly. And there we can see them a bit better. San Giorgio in his blue cape, royal blue cape, he will top one of the cherry. Santubaldo, the colors of the carrier of Ubaldo are yellow. Sant'Antonio, the carriers of Sant Antonio all wear black. And these three saints leave the church only on May 15th when they'll be topping the cherry, which are raced up the mountain. And once the cherry return to the Basilica of St. Dubaldo, the cherry are placed against the wall, as we saw them before, and the saints are carried that night in procession back to their little church. In the crypt of the church is a stone cover of a tomb, and it's a medieval cover of a tomb. It was found in the 19th century, not far from the church, and it is said to be the cover of the tomb where uh, the wolf was buried that, uh, with, for, with whom Francis made peace. And actually, in the, it was found, I think, at the end of the 19th century, a Gubbio vet at the time, I think his name was Spinacci, confirmed that the skeleton in that tomb under the cover was a skeleton of a wolf. So a strong link of Francis with a wolf.
As you can see also in this painting by Felice Damiani, who's a Gubbio painter. And this painting is here now in the Palazzo dei Consoli in the Civic Museum, which is in this building. And this is a depiction of the Franciscan saints and the citizens of Gubbio. Look at their beautiful dress here. And Francis is asking the Virgin and her son to care for the citizens of Gubbio. John the Baptist is intervening as well, the other patron saint of Gubbio. And we see all the Franciscan saints. Francis, above all, with the wolf. And below him, on our left, as we look at it, Bernard of Siena, holding the plaque IHS, Jesus Hominum Salvatorum, which he carried when he preached about the love that one should have for Christ in the 15th century. Remember that he preached also in Perugia. He preached in Assisi. St. Anthony of Padua, St. Bonaventure, Franciscan, and one of the biographies of Francis, Claire of Assisi, holding the monstrance, Elizabeth of Hungary, who was a Franciscan tertiary. So all the Franciscan saints uh, portrayed by Felice Damiani. Now, as we walk up to this Palazzo dei Consoli, however, we want to observe something of the medieval architecture characteristic of Gubbio, the death door, Porta dei Morti. That is a narrow door higher up. It was not at street level. Next to the wider door, this would have had a, a medieval arch. Here's another death door, Porto dei Morti. This is the home of someone who's supporting Sant'Antonio for the race. Up the steps, you see, sometimes the death door remains the entry to a home. This would have been the wider door. Sometimes the death door will become a shop window. Narrower door above street level, wider door. You can see the death door combinations if you keep your eyes open in the medieval towns. There's even places in Assisi where I like to point out the death door on an Assisi guided tour. Places in Spello, you know, places in Orvieto, but especially in Gubbio because the architecture remains medieval unaltered. There's a lot of restoration in the other towns. The medieval buildings are destroyed. Renaissance buildings are built. Not in Gubbio. Everything remains medieval. Death door. It would have been higher than this door in the Middle Ages. The street level has changed a bit. Death door. Wide door. Narrow door. What is the death door about? Ridiculous guidebooks tell you they were built for the carrying out of a dead body. You wouldn't build a door just for the carrying out of a body. No, death door was a way to create a small fortress out of your house in a very violent period called the Middle Ages. How did the system work? You went in this door at the end of the day, you bolted it heavily. From here, this was your stall area maybe, maybe they were animals, your olive oil, wine cellar, where you butchered pigs or whatever. From this room to this room and the stairs going up to your house, there was another door right here. You went in, bolted that door, went up the stairs. This was accessible only by ladder. And you're renting your house a fortress in the Middle Ages. Why is it called death door? Because when it no longer served its function as defense, perhaps a Gubbio historian friend told me this at the time of a death, the body would have been carried down and out this door, which was higher than street level. Let's use this window right here as an example, this death door right here. And the funeral cart would have been here and the body wrapped in a shroud could be placed gently in the funeral cart. One theory of why it's called the Porta della Morte. So we've passed some of the Porta della Morte we're up at City Hall, and we're going into the magnificent Palazzo dei Consoli. We've seen the video of the bell ringers who are up here, five uh, bell ringers for the important festivities, five of the 12. And we're noticing that these battlements here are Guelph battlements. 
going like this, zig and zag. Guelph. Gubbio was very often sympathetic to the papacy. It's a Guelph city. Let's contrast these battlements with Ghibelline battlements. Ghibellines were supportive of the emperors. This is a medieval palace of Fabriano in the Marches region, just to show you the difference between the battlements, Guelph and Ghibelline. So these are Ghibelline, supporters of civic authority. When they built the Palazzo dei Consoli in the 14th century, they had decided they did not wish to build the palace in any specific quartieri of Gubbio or any of the four districts, but in the center of town so that that Palazzo dei Consoli touches all four of the district in a way, the main piazza in front of it does. What did they do to create such a structure? They had to level out a slice of the hill and the sustaining of the resulting piazza is thanks to four huge open vaults, giving this the name Piazza Pensile, a suspended square or suspended piazza. It's absolutely astounding. And you can walk this road along here and you see that these are open vaults. So Palazzo dei Consoli, Piazza Grande, the big square. And this is Palazzo della Podesta, uh, the palace of the mayor. So we see all of the architecture of Gubbio, the civic architecture collected together around this square. Now let's enter in Palazzo dei Consoli. We're going up this magnificent noble staircase. We're gonna enter through this door. This has an interesting inscription, which I'd like to mention to you. It has a fresco above it as well. And this is an interesting inscription for this reason. Inscriptions on medieval palaces were always, or generally, let's say, should have been always, would have been the correct word, in Latin. The exception is Gubbio. This is Italian Vulgate. And it says that this stone was placed here, that is the building of the architrave in, uh, you can see the date, 1336, so an unusual inscription in the Italian uh, Vulgate rather than Latin on a civic building. We enter in and we're in the Sala dell'Arengo, which is the room of the haranguing, if you will. This is where the general consul of the Eugubini, the citizens of Gubbio would meet. The general consul was one of the governing bodies. It was composed of uh, 50 citizens from each of the four districts, which were of the popular class, non-noble, and 40 citizens of each of the four districts, which were of the nobility. And they could meet here, discuss, uh, and harangue if they would so desire the consuls who lived in the upper part of the palace. They were the most important of the civic body and they were elected for terms of two months, two from each district, and they could not leave during their terms of office. So they couldn't be, uh, shall we say, influenced by outsiders. So in this building, it's interesting to see some of the oldest toilets you can imagine anywhere. They date from the 14th century. And the consuls spoke to the Gran Consiglio, the big council down here through this window. And therefore they couldn't get their hands on the consuls if there was something aggravating them about present government. This fresco here at the base of the stairs, let me show you in an enlarged image of it, was by a Gubbio painter, Melo da Gubbio, dates from the mid 14th century. And here we have the patron saints of Gubbio flanking the Virgin, John the Baptist, who will be on her right, most important position, because he comes before and was the cousin of Christ, and Ubaldo, Bishop of Gubbio, looking out as if to say to all those of the general council, guide, uh, this city well and with intelligence, if you will, sort of looking out over them. And an image by Melo da Gubbio is also upstairs in the museum. It's John the Baptist, again, mid 14th century. And that gesture is actually the gesture of a prophet because he was prophesying. 
that one will come greater than I am. I am preceding one who will be greater. He will be the Lamb of God. And that, of course, will be Christ, his cousin. Also upstairs is a beautiful processional banner dating from the 16th century, probably by Sidney Baldo Ibi, a painter of Gubbio. And this is Ubaldo. There is an image on the other side of the Blessed Virgin, uh, Mother of Mercy image. And this was carried in procession. It would have been carried even in the processions at the time of the race of the Chetty, but it is later substituted by a statue. It is now in the museum, a processional banner called a gonfalone, a big flag, if you will. The most precious objects in Civic Palace are certainly the Eugubin tablets, bronze tablets dating from the third to first century BC, which are transcriptions of the religious texts texts with a S, pardon me, of the Eugubin people, the people of Ecuvium. And it was very important for them that their religious texts were conserved also on non-perishable materials. They were certainly inscribed on waterproof linen sheets, bark, and other perishable materials. But by the third century, Roman incursions are frequent in the town, and they decide that it's very important that something permanent be conserved for future generations of their religious texts. And these five of the seven tablets are inscribed on both sides. You're only seeing five of them here, but in a minute, I think I'll be able to show you all seven. And two are in the Latin alphabet. And the Latin alphabet ones are the most recent ones, but I'm gonna show those to you in just a second, right here. Uh, these are the seven bronze tablets. We've got two here and we have five right here. Uh, this is one of the great archaeological treasures of Italy, actually. And it is to be considered that they were found in 1444 near the Roman theater. They were sold to the city of Gubbio in 1456. And this is the birth of archaeology. Um, because the selling of them means that the city wishes to have this uh, ancient object, something to do with their ancient culture, which will be treasured and studied by generations. Across from the tablets is this fresco right here. There is one here on the wall, which is detached as well. But I want to point out this fresco right here. This is called Maestà de Consoli, the, uh, the majesty of uh, this, the, the Palazzo dei Consoli, the virgin in majesty, the Madonna. And she has on her right four saints. They're presenting to her one of the ruling families of Gubbio, this is one of the Gabrielli, and the Gabrielli uh, coat of arms was right here. That was eliminated because some years after the city of Gubbio decided that no coats of arms of any family could appear anywhere except in city hall and maybe on churches. And they are entrusting him to the Virgin. And alas, Gabrielli has this painted probably. He will later usurp power of Gubbio for his own family. Um, right here, we have two examples of the Eugubine tablets. The most recent ones are inscribed in the Latin alphabet because by this time, this is 1st BC, remember that Gubbio has become a Roman municipium as of 87 BC. The ones prior to that were inscribed in the Etruscan alphabet. Um, the language is Umbrian. So the reading of these tablets would be in the Umbrian language, but first inscribed in the Etruscan alphabet and later inscribed in the Latin alphabet. One of the greatest archeological treasures probably of Europe, certainly of Italy, the Eugubine tablets. 
and very, very related to the Cherry Festival. And I'm going to tell you why in just a second. Augusto Ancelotti is one of the world authorities on the Eogubin tablets, and he is the assessor of culture of Gubbio. He runs a building company. He's a builder, but he has studied the Eogubin tablets for over 30 years. Here he's given a lecture on them to a student group. And he has said this, those Iguvin tablets, after all, remind us of those values which we must treasure and protect, incised in bronze, not by chance, but be precisely because they have stopped the passage of time, because they represent something immutable and fundamental. Now, what fascinates me about the Eugubin tablets is their relationship to the Cheri, the Corsa dei Cheri. The Cheri are in the Palazzo dei Consoli as of May 1st. May 1st, they're carried down from the Basilica of Sant'Ubaldo and they will remain here until the start of the Corsa dei Cheri. Cheri, candles carried in the funeral procession of Ubaldo. Mm. Cerfus was the Urban God of Fertility. Three cherry, mm, interesting, for the people of Ecubium, three city gates, three rites of divinization, three sacrificial animals offered for auspicious regions at certain times of the year. And not only, the tablets declare that before offering a bull calf as sacrifice to Jove, the priest sacrificing must declare it three times fit for sacrifice and then declare three times that the sacrifice was a votive offering. <clears throat> so the Ecuvium culture is rich with this repetitive importance of the number three. Not only that, but one of the most important rites of the people of ancient Ecuvium was the anointing with oil of the sacred obelisk, and they danced around it. Could those cherry not resemble the sacred obelisk after all? Carry down from the mountains on May 1st. This is the chair of Sant'Ubaldo and all little Ubaldari, San Giorgio and San Giorgiari, and these even could be the teenagers who will run the race of the teenagers, which is the last Sunday of May. Sant'Antoniari on the chair of Sant'Antonio, and these certainly are Mezzani, that is the teenagers who run the Cherry, but uh, slightly smaller than those on the last Sunday in May. And do you know in World War II, for four years, the Cherry Mezzani were being run because the men were off fighting the wars. All through Gubbio, just prior to May 15th, the glorious banners hang out, Ubaldo, San Giorgio, in some families, you'll see both. Santubaldo, this is Santubaldo Banner. In another home here, uh, we have San Giorgiari, Santubaldari, because I mentioned you will uh, support or wish uh, to be attached to a saint for emotional reasons. Maybe your father was a carrier of the San Giorgio Cero. Maybe your father-in-law was the carrier of the Santu Baldaro Cero. That means one of your children you'll dress as a San Giorgiano, the other you might dress as a Santu Baldaro. And you can see here this family, the day of the Cherry. He's probably going to go soon to pick up the Cherry and run it to Sant'Antoniato. And they also, of course, have the banner of Santu Baldo out. The banners are sold at different places in town. Uh, I think in 2017, I was in Google for the chatty with Liz and John. This is a photo of them under some of the banners. And this is a shop where you could buy your little outfits, royal blue, black or yellow, and probably where I got my San Giorgio scarf that I always wear. And I always wear royal blue on May 15th. And the Festival kicks off in the morning with the bands playing through Gubbio. Passion is already high. The Capitano comes on horseback with swords raised. He's the first Capitano because he has a plumed hat, master of ceremonies, followed by the second Capitano. Then come the Alfieri. They're bearing the flags of Gubbio. You see the five mounds, as mentioned, representing the five hills around Gubbio. Santubaldo. 
first. This is the capo dieci. He's the head of the team that will carry that chero. And he has the pitcher, which will be used to baptize the chero. See his black badge with the miter and the crozier? This is the head of the Santo Baldo uh, team. The capo dieci is elected in winter, and they spend months deciding where to place different members of their group along the routes as they run the chari. And there could be up to a thousand on the team. But when you run up the mountain, you might move in and move out and switch places every yard or so. We're going to see that when we see it in the video. So there are many, many cheraioli. This gentleman is going to carry the chero later and he'll probably give his little daughter back to his wife. Santa Antoniari here. Passion begins very young for one of the cherry. There we have a San Giorgiara and a little Sant'Antoniaro. Ubaldari here. And this is the group of Sant'Antonio. This is the Capo Dieci, see his badge. He's the head of his group of Ceraioli, carrying the brocca or the pitcher that will be used to baptize the Cero. So we're heading up through the back streets. Uh, this is our uh, Cheri group of 2019, Celia and Jean, old friends from Santa Clara and others in the group. Uh, and we're off to head up after we've seen the events of the morning to have a delightful lunch before the afternoon events. We're at the Fontana dei Matti, the fountain of the madmen. And I don't know if we did it, probably, because I always do it. You run around the fountain three times, of course, and you're baptized by someone from Gubbio, and you're an official madman or madwoman of Gubbio. And some people say if you buy that uh, license to be mad, you're really crazy. You can purchase the license if you wish. And we'll get quickly up to the main square because the bells are already ringing to announce that the festival's starting. After the bells come the trumpeters, hands wave as, the way, as if you were waving flags. The hands are waving, the trumpets are blaring, the drumming starts, the banner wavers are waving their banners, the Gubbio banner wavers, and those are special banners for the day of the Cherry. The door opens, out comes Santubaldo, run down the steps, San Giorgio coming out next. This is the inscription over the door. Remember that I talked to you about fresco over the door? City Hall, because they're in there from May 1st to May 15th. Sant'Antonio, oh, excuse me, that's San Giorgio, so, excuse me, backwards, Ubaldo. Giorgio, Sant'Antonio, Antoniari, and then out come the statues, Ubaldo, and everybody will try to touch these, the cherry and the statues. Giorgio, then Antonio, and then the three broche. They're already filled with water because they're going to be used to baptize the cherry. And what they are doing here is they're about to throw the broke out to the crowds. They've already baptized their cherry. The chero is fit into the barella, which means the stretcher. The pin right here, water is poured. The pin will swell up, so it will fit very well. And now comes the moment of culmination. The raising up of the cherry. This is the raising up of the cherry. And this is called Il Volo dell'Angelo. They tried to leap off. These are the three capo dieci in unison. The crowds are absolutely going wild. And then they run how many times around the flagpole? Just guess, three, of course. The three cherry run three times around the flagpole and everybody's going wild. After they run, they run a bit through the streets, then they take a break for lunch. So do we, we head to one of my favorite restaurants because the band will come through during lunch and everybody's up and dancing, waving their flags. There we all are waving our napkins, singing along with the band. There's some Santu Baldari behind us here. Everybody knows the Cherry songs. And then in the afternoon, 
after lunch and the Cheraioli are going to run up the mountain, all the carriers of the Cheri, the Cheraioli, have had a wonderful banquet. The St. Ubaldo statue is taken out of the cathedral, the Duomo, and carried through the streets of Gubbio. Look at all the people at their windows with the different banners. And there's dancing in the streets all afternoon, bands playing in every single piazza. And the passion is evident, the joy in the separation of Santubaldo. And I really wish to say before I end that it has been very, very difficult. Uh, this May was really painful for the people of Gubbio, unable to celebrate the Corsa dei Ceri, and it's already been announced by the city of Gubbio with great pain that also this year, because of COVID, the Corsa dei Ceri, May 15th, is canceled. So let's hope that in a year, you can all meet me in Gubbio on May 15th to share in this. <laughs> And then when they get to the mountain, the cherry are lowered, Ubaldo's there first. His barella will be lowered so that he can be carried into the basilica, followed by San Giorgio. And then this is what's hilarious and wonderful. Ubaldo goes in, the door is slammed. The San Giorgio are outside, swearing with every imaginable imper imprecation, and we're at the Basilica of the Patron Saint. The language is most colorful, to put it lightly. Then Giorgio gets in, and then Anthony gets in. And as a Gubbio friend has told me, or maybe it was Katya Mariani, who's got such a big help, the evening when the statues are carried back, to the little church which we saw, San Francesco della Pace, the chaplain there will say prayers when the saints are returned, and the prayer will be to ask forgiveness for the abominable language used in front of the wonderful Basilica of Santubaldo. And I'd like to end without using any abominable language at all, simply saying, Viva Ubaldo! And may we all be together soon in Gubbio. Grazie.